By the fall of 1943, the United States Army Air Force's 8th Air Force Bomber Command was beginning to rethink their bombing strategy over occupied Europe. They had initially believed that four-engine bombers like the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress and the consolidated B-24 Liberator, with their many defensive 50 caliber machine guns, could defend themselves as they flew deep into enemy territory during their daytime bombing raids. Command didn't see the need for escort fighters to accompany the heavies all the way to and from the targets because of the supposed safety large close formations maintained. Fighters like the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt reached their maximum operational range near the western border of Germany. After that, American bombers were at the mercy of the German Luftwaffe, and they were inflicting severe losses. Robert Rosie Rosenthal joined the 100th Bomb Group as a replacement pilot in late September 1943. His first week of missions commanding a B-17 crew part of the 418th Bombardment Squadron was nothing less than a baptism by fire. His first mission on October 8, 1943 was a brutal raid on Bremen to strike the shipyards and industrial area. The flak was described as being so thick that they could have landed on it. The 100th lost seven aircraft. The next day, they flew a mission to Marienburg over the Polish corridor in East Prussia to bomb a Fokovov aircraft factory. The 100th didn't lose any bombers, but it proved a long, exhausting raid. They were still recovering when on October 10th, they received another mission order, this time to Münster. Their early morning briefing proved a shock to many because rather than a precision strike on a military or industrial target, their aiming point was the center of the old walled city, a marshalling yard and the nearby homes of the railway workers. This was a radical change in American bombing practice. Some men who had lost friends in previous raids cheered, others felt sick. There was a cathedral only a few blocks away and Sunday mass would be letting out as they reached their target. Rosenthal and his crew, like many, were flying their third mission in three days. Their regular plane, Rosie's Riveters, had been heavily damaged on their previous missions, so they flew the B-17 Royal Flush. He recalled they were too tired to care one way or another. 53 bombers of the 13th Combat Wing assembled over Great Yarmouth. The 95th Bomb Group flew in the lead position, the 390th in the high. The 100th was once again in the exposed low. They led 13 other groups of the 1st and 3rd Bombardment Division for a total of over 250 B-17s in formation. The 100th had managed to scrape together 18 aircraft for the mission, plus two barred from the 390th to make an even 20, but seven had to abort, leaving only 13 to continue to Münster. As they crossed into Germany and approached the initial point, their P-47 escort fighters reached the limit of their range and turned for home. They came under fire from flak, as well as sporadic attacks from German aircraft, but as they neared the Ruhr industrial region, hundreds of German intercept fighters attacked head-on. It was the most violent and concentrated assault the division had yet experienced. Flying in the low, the 100th took the brunt of the attack. Wave after wave of fighters made passes against them at tremendous closing speeds, not breaking contact until they were within a split second of colliding with the bombers. Captain Frank Murphy, the navigator aboard Aw R Go, recalled several times turning his head and bracing for head-on collision. This was his 21st mission, and he had never seen this many fighters at one time. Cannon shells exploded through the formation, and B-17s began to drop out. The first was the lead plane flown by Captain John Brady and command pilot Major John Egan. A massive fiery explosion directly under the aircraft sent it into a sickening dive. Brady and Egan argued who should be the last to leave the crippled bomber, but a final pass of German machine gun bullets convinced Egan to go first, despite his senior rank. Larger twin-engine fighters like the ME-110 and Ju-88 flew parallel to the bombers and fired unguided rockets from outside their gunner's range. Swarms of single-engine fighters then broke up and scattered their tight combat box. Within minutes, the 100th ceased to exist as an organized fighting unit. Rosenthal believed the intensity of the German attack was aimed at turning the bombers back for the first time. Six of their B-17s managed to fight their way to the target. The fighters halted their attack as heavy flak filled the sky. They released their 500-pound bombs on the city center with deadly effect. The marshalling yard was heavily damaged, and most of the medieval townhouses in the vicinity were flattened. 
700 civilians were killed. The Münster Cathedral, however, was only slightly damaged. Almost as soon as the bombers turned away, the German fighters were back to start the onslaught once again. Five more B-17s were quickly brought down, leaving Rosenthal's battered crew alone and exposed. Rosenthal desperately went into a series of maneuvers, every kind of evasive action. The plane was all over the sky. Their gunners needed a stable platform to accurately return fire, but if he kept the plane level, they would have been shot down. The emboldened German fighters continued to pursue, but some fell prey to the bomber's deadly 50 caliber guns. Eventually, they got frustrated and left to find an easier target. Royal Flush was filled with hundreds of holes. They were too crippled to keep up with the other groups, so they were on their own. Their oxygen system had been disabled, so they dropped below 10,000 feet to breathe. There was a large rocket hole through the right wing, and two of their engines were out. Both waste gunners were seriously wounded, and their tail gunner had been hit. Rosenthal later said, In a situation like that, you don't think about dying. You focus on what you have to do to save the plane and crew. You drive everything else out of your mind. You're frightened, but there's a difference between fear and panic. Panic paralyzes. Fear energizes. You sweat even at 50 degrees below zero. When they finally made it back to their base at Thorpe Abbotts, they popped red flares to signal wounded abort, and nearly everyone on the base rushed the runway as they skidded to a halt. Rosenthal climbed out, turned to the intelligence officer and asked, are they all this tough? Then climbed into the back of the ambulance with his wounded gunners. The 13th Combat Wing lost 25 of the 30 total bombers that day. The 95th Bomb Group lost five planes. The 390th lost eight. And the bloody 100th lost 12. Of the 140 officers that had begun operations at Thorpe Abbotts with the 100th Bomb Group four months earlier, there were only three left on flying status. The group had lost 200 men, including two squadron leaders, in that week alone. The 8th Air Force lost 88 B-17s in three days, nearly 900 men. Weather conditions and the lack of aircraft and crews forced them to stand down for the next four days. Their next mission, flown on October 14th, would be even worse than Münster. Those who had lived through the first portion of Black Week would have to face Schweinfurt for the second time, and with it, the single bloodiest day of the air war in 1943. 